Hola, I'm Herson Borrero, Editor-at-Large for City and State, and we're at City and State TV right now. We have a uh, regular visitor uh, to uh, all of you folks and actually watch us um, when we do stream live from Albany or from New York or from San Juan, Puerto Rico. Or Marco Crepo, who is um, not only the assembly, an assemblyman from the Bronx, you, one of the youngest in the assembly right now, and you're almost with some degree of seniority, which is amazing. I was looking at, you just turned 35, right? I'm turning 35 in July. In ju well, it is July. Well, later this month. Later that's this right. Month. That's, that's right. It is July. It is July, which <laughs> he doesn't even know. But Marco Crepo is also, uh, was recently, as, as part of all of this wave of change that started this 2015, um, you were also elected to become um, county chair of the Bronx Democratic Organization, in addition to which you were already selected prior since last year. Uh, to head the, um, the Hispanic Task Force of the New York State Legislature. And in both capacities, uh, I think you're know, one of the youngest people to serve in both capacities. So let's start out with the legislature. Uh, we're doing some of an update with you. Um, you come into this whole situation. I know that prior, uh, I'll give you an example. I remember you and Senator Peralta walking out of a meeting last year when there was again disappointment with the DREAM Act and you were not happy and uh, I remember also Assemblyman Moya who has been leading the charge in the Assembly. Where are you right now with the status of things the way this session just ended? Is, are we just seeing more of the game that's always being played in you know in, in Albany where even people like you with a certain degree of importance are not getting their voice heard? I, I wouldn't categorize it. I think what I've learned in the beginning when I first started in Albany, it was all emotion. It was pure emotion. It still is on the issues that matter to us, but I've started to understand, and the more time you spend in this, you realize the many factors that make the world go round up in Albany, how the institution functions, and the realities of how to get things done and whether the timing of things, uh, that's the key part. It's, I remember in college, they teach us the policy window. I mean, I realized that in Albany, that window opens and closes very quickly. Um, and, and, it's, and it's not even a matter of who's trying to pull it open. It's just, it's society and it's what presents itself at a time. So, for example, criminal justice reform. I'll give you, give you another very example before we get back to that. Very important. Criminal issue. justice reform has been at the forefront of the caucus priorities since the Amadou Diallo incident and actually prior to that. And yet we talked about it, we talked about it, we talked about it, and it wasn't until Eric Gardner's case and all of the, the Raleigh Grams of the world and all the other cases that happened in a very short period of time that forced us to all of a sudden say, criminal justice reform, top priority, we gotta get something done. And, and the truth is that's just the way things function. Is that a, a result of a lack of importance or relevance from the minority members? No, it's just that the political priorities that, and the dynamics that play out in Albany when you have two competing parties looking for various different interests you know, who have to both agree on something, make things very difficult. The DREAM Act finds itself in a similar situation. Um, are we disappointed? Yes. Do we think and we would have hoped that the governor could have done what he did with the gay marriage issue and the SAFE Act issue and, and, and force some Republican senators to maybe vote on those things? Yes. Uh, can he? You know what? I'm not so sure, and I'll tell you why. Unlike with those other issues, with the, with the DREAM Act, the Republican majority put commercials and bank their entire future saying we would never allow undocumented to get state dollars, your taxpayer dollars. They made that their issue. It became a symbol. It's not the issue itself. When you talk to members one-on-one, -on -one, they tell you they're sympathetic. But it's the politics of it. For them, this was the example of what their majority and how it differs from what Democrats could do if they were there. And they used it as fear-mongering and they, they made it a line in the sand. They were willing to negotiate almost everything else under the sun except that issue. But you have women's equality. There was even a party created by this governor. Where are women in this state in terms, you know, you talk about everybody getting their yeah, peace, but, but women continue to be, be but, put but remember, back on the agenda. Is it the tyranny of the immediacy or the immediate politics that is really dominating what happens? I mean, I, I'm a big boy, I've been around, I know, so are you growing up in this, that, that there is an immediate tyranny that dictates what's gonna happen. 
In the case of uh, women's equality, it's a serious issue in, in, in what continues to be really a disgrace and, and not dealt with not only in New York State, in the entire nation and in the world. But Hurston, remember what happened. So the 10-point women's agenda was put forward, the most controversial of which was the 10th point, the choice issue. And, and when the Senate majority said we would not do the 10 points, they started to say, well, we'll do the other nine. The other nine had been bills that we had already passed for years in Albany. But they did it this time around because they wanted to avoid the 10th issue, which again, it becomes a platform issue on the political spectrum for them, for their base. We ended up doing the other nine bills. And so the women's plan, the majority of which got done this year, it's, it fell under the radar with all the attention on the other big items. Uh, but the, the fact is a lot more got done. And it's amazing how these things work. You put that whole agenda forward and, and yet nine out of the 10 got done and we didn't give it as much fanfare as we would have. Again, was it the political expediency of the election time that they wanted to talk about it as a women's agenda or was it really the issues? With the DREAM Act, it's kind of a similar dynamic. I'll tell you why. You have the full-blown DREAM Act a commitment to treat undocumented students who go to our public schools, who graduate with tremendous potential, and give them an opportunity to go on to college. There are those that would say, well, we can't treat them the same because they're, they're, they're not here legally. They're not here, they don't have a, a status. Some of, some of us will say, I don't care what we call it. What I care is that those students are not denied an opportunity to continue their education. But even within our community, we have this dynamic. Do we hold out for the full shebang, or do we say, if we can find them scholarships, if we can get them the assistance that they need, the rest is semantics. Even within our community, there's a little bit of discrepancy about that. The governor has, has tied himself to that and said, well, why aren't you guys supportive of other alternatives? And even the Senate majority, which remember the first time they introduced the Dream Fund, Senate majority said no. Then they came around and said, okay, we'll do the fund. We won't do the act. It is certainly not the priority of our community and polls have demonstrated. I've also said that it's not a priority when you put it in context of all of this. Let me bring you back to the women's equality issue because it's also a matter of the optics. Mm -hmm. Still have three men in a room, three males. Andrew Stewart Cousins is senator, your colleague is still left out of the discussions, there's still three males. And it, what surprises me, you have two daughters, don't you? Mm -hmm. I have two daughters. The governor has three daughters. He doesn't get it, he doesn't still get it. He builds a women's equality party, he talks all this baba, that's gibberish. With all the respect, Andrew, the fact is that he doesn't get what he's doing because it, it means optics. If you're gonna push, you can pass all the bills you want. But if you still have that really not an understanding that a person with three daughters doesn't get it, and you have two, and I'm not in the legislature, right. but I have two daughters, so, so it goes beyond, and you know it, Marcos, you don't want your infant daughters right now to face the kind, same kind of you know, sex discrimination based on gender right. that, that, that excludes them as not being equal to men. I'll tell you what, Hurston, this is my opinion. You're absolutely right. I want my daughters to feel as empowered as anyone else, no matter who they're competing against, as they grow into their professions. But look at it this way. We have Hillary Clinton at the forefront of the presidential campaign on the Democratic side. We're all supportive of her. We believe that- Oh, you're so now you're supporting her? I am supporting Hillary Oh, you Clinton. decided, when did you do that? Last time we spoke, you had you not- just, You just got the exclusive. Okay, we will be, so you when will this be air, you, when does this air? When does this air? We will be announcing our endorsement of Hillary Clinton in the Bronx. What, how do you, what was the process? Last time we spoke, we had, you, you were sort of was walking you know, pushed it. against the wall by Rubencito Diaz Jr. Who no, 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 don't let tell me, me because I, I'm tell you. Okay, let me get, let me get to, <laughs> tell me how you did it. How, how did you, sure. what was the process? Sure, we had a conversation early on, that was the meeting you were alluding to, where we had an open discussion, and I said we would not make a decision until mm -hmm. we had more interaction with the camps. Um, at that point, we did that, we reached out, we had a few conversations with Hillary's folks to find out what her platform is. We requested her position statements on some of the issues that were important. We were, I was extremely grateful that she came out on the issue of Puerto Rico, finally spoke on it, the first candidate, I believe, to address that issue head on. Um, we had a, we invited the camp to come into county, we had a meeting with the executive board, we invited the members, the district leaders to come in and ask their questions of their team and we had a conversation. At, between that time I also talked one on one with most of my colleagues to find out where they were. So we wanted to make sure that everyone was at the same place and comfortable to move forward and we decided that it was the right thing to do. When is the formal endorsement going to be done? Have you spoken to him Before this airs. <laughs> so you mean today? No, we should be coming out with our formal uh, announcement uh, this week. This week. Question, did you get a chance to talk to Hillary Rodham Clinton? I did at her event. 
very briefly, um, but we I was at the Roosevelt Island event when she announced and she had made her, her speech and I was there with the borough president. Um, she, she from on the platform as she was walking by, we had a brief conversation and she said hello. Fortunately, I didn't have anybody with me to record this. Um, and her parting words were, I love the Bronx. <laughs> oh, really? Okay. Let's see how much she loves the Bronx. But wait a minute. If she loves the Bronx as, as much as Cuomo, who got overwhelming support and has done very little. I, I'm saying that. I know that, you know, because he's not treating the Bronx as he does Buffalo. And, you know, the, the Bronx could use an infusion of a billion dollars like he did, you know. And, the and Bronx could use more resources, of course. But, Herson, we have a tremendous uh, improvement in our unemployment rate, well, a reduction of our unemployment rate. True. A lot of that is the borough president, the elected officials, other initiatives, but also the Department of Labor, which came in. And under Peter Rivera's uh, leadership, when, when he initiated this, they started a strike force initiative in the Bronx. They didn't start in the Buffalo, they started in the Bronx, yeah. helping with that reduction. There are a number of items I could point to where the governor has done the right thing. What I, my criticism of the you know, governor- Show me the money. I'll that's tell what you I'm what, my, about. Show I'll me give the you, money. I'll give you an example. And I'll, that's, that's what I'll love give, to me. I'll tell you love what. Love comes in many ways. But I'll give you an example of that. In this case, it's with dollars. I'll give you an example. I don't see them. I'm gonna give you an example of that. I was very critical when the governor announced the uh, regional economic councils. I was one of the first members who got up in conference and I said it to the governor directly at one of his receptions in the mansion. And I said, I'm really upset and I'm really concerned that you're creating these councils and you're putting the Bronx in the same council as the entire city of New York. We're going to end up getting the short end of the stick like we have for years. First round, we got more than half the money. Okay, but let, let me get back to Hillary. Yeah. What convinced <laughs> you, besides the conversation, so you went through a process of you personally respecting each member, what they thought and all that. So did you get consensus or were there any concerns? And has no, the I mean, responses you've gotten from the Hillary camp, and the, besides the, you know, that I love the Bronx kind of stuff from Hillary Rodham Clinton, because I'm sure she loves a few different counties every day. <laughs> right now she loves every county. She loves <laughs> every county. <laughs> what is it that Hillary has, or for example, different from a Bernie Sanders? I'll tell you. Or, I'll tell you no. for me. I'll tell you for me. And you know me. I'm not the the. I'm not at the far end of any of the political spectrum. I'm I'm pretty much a moderate in the middle of a lot of things. Mm -hmm. But for me, it's two things. Number one, I strongly believe that a woman is ready to lead this country. I believe that, and and I think that she's prime. With President Obama, we saw someone who had tremendous ideas and one of the most one of the best orators in the world. But could he translate that in terms of leadership to get things done? And unfortunately, he didn't have a cooperative Congress, and a lot of his best ideas ended up either never getting done or watered down to the point that you know they weren't what they were supposed to be. So we saw that level of inefficiency in terms of you know being able to deliver. The president promised us immigration reform in the first hundred days, never happened, and he spent all of his capital getting his uh, uh, a watered down version of Obamacare to the point that even that didn't reach as many people and help as many people as it should have. And he had to take away key pieces, but he banked on that. In the end, he didn't have any capital left to deliver on immigration issue, which is affecting just as many people as those that are uninsured, if you look at the numbers. So we, so I want somebody with experience. I think Hillary has that experience. I think she's capable of leading. I think she has, uh, certainly in New York, a lot of support. As I talk to members, remember most of our folks were with her before they were with Obama. So they were ready for Hillary a long time ago. And I think a lot of that uh, level of cooperation uh, for mutual admiration, there were members who were around and worked with her as she was U.S. Senator and, and have strong ties to her and, and her work. Um, so this is, you know, I think Hillary is someone you can judge based on what she's been able to do. Is it all good? No. Anybody who's been in a position too long, you're going to have a lot to be critical of and a lot to be supportive of. Uh, but I think she has a base. She knows New York. She knows the issues. She's worked with a lot of our members. That's one of the major feedback that I, that I did receive from different members. They were very supportive and wanted to see us be with her. It was expected we would be with her. She has the strongest base here in New York. Um, but we wanted to make sure we went through a process where we heard everybody and we thought it out before we made a decision. If not, we would have probably announced it a long time ago. Is there any, as I'm listening to you, you mentioned Obama. I, he, I'm not going to get into that, but I, I've got to say on the president's behalf, who I've been critical of, he's had a tremendous summer. I mean, this oh, has he's been, been a, on a, a roll. success. He's, he's, he's been, been on a roll. roll. I mean, and, and, the, and you did mention the obstruction with his own party, never mind the Republicans. Since we're into politics, is Mayor de Blasio doing the right thing by hold, still holding out and not endorsing Hillary, or do you see just this as a way for him to put himself as, give himself some a degree of importance. 
you know, it, that, that's a hard question. I remember that being asked when, if, when he first said it. He right. it. I was surprised. I expected the relationship to, to equate to. But you know what? Maybe I'll tell so you what. You the There's a lot of ways the I could look at it. But I'll tell you what. For the average voter who always says, ah, all these politicians, they're all in cahoots. All, right. This is an example that it doesn't always play out that way. Two people who are very close to one another. Right. Who you would think. You would assume you could bank your mortgage. Oh, he's going to be with her no matter what. The fact that the mayor said, I want to hear her out, I can't be critical of that. Okay. Um, am I surprised? A little. Um, do I think he's doing it because for this reason or that? I don't know. I'm not going to venture into what's in the mind of Mayor de Blasio. But I think everybody has a right to wait it out and to listen. And I think that makes politics better, to not assume things, but to rather have to earn them from, from the people you believe are closest to you. Now that we're in terms of the mayor, uh, going back to the legislature, and uh, appreciate your time because I know you're busy, a busy That's summer. Um, the um, mayor's griping, complaining, whining about the fact that he didn't get mayoral control. Do you think that that occurred not because of this schoolyard fight between two kids like him and Andrew Cuomo, fighting like two kids in a schoolyard, but rather because the assembly saw and the legislature saw that in fact He's not ready for that kind of demand? Or is, no. it, is it a test period? Or is it something? What's the skepticism? Why did it happen from your point? Yeah, I'll tell you, from my vantage point, a couple of things. Um, as much as we'd like to look at issue by issue on its own merits, at the end of session, just like with the budget, a lot of things end up getting tied to one another inexplicably in terms of, you know, if we're willing to do this, but, you know, what about this issue? It all gets tied as a bundle, so to speak. Um, and I think with all the other priorities, the rent regulation was our key priority. That was the most important piece for our constituencies across, you know, those democratic neighborhoods. And we wanted to make sure we delivered on that. Um, of course, we wanted to see an extension of mayoral control. I was one who opposed mayoral control when it was Bloomberg's days. Um, but I didn't, I didn't, if we gave it to Bloomberg and we saw the, the issues that we dealt with, with decision making that didn't take into account our points of views, I think Mayor de Blasio has approached it from a different perspective. He's, I can't say I'm blown away necessarily by, by some of the ideas, but I think he, some of the ideas that he's presented, he's looking to execute on them the right way. For example, his community schools vision. I've heard that pr proposal before, but I've seen the mayor go out and try to really provide the resources that have to back up those initiatives in the schools that need it. So to me, I think he's done a good job. I think he's trying to do the right thing. And I would have supported more years, and the assembly's position was more years. There were members who, do not, who still oppose mayoral control on their merits and would have preferred that we did nothing on mayoral control. So I think in the scheme of things, it wasn't so much this or that. It was just that in the totality of everything that got negotiated, it ended up in a one year, we'll revisit it next year. Talk about the way that things get bundled and happening in, 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 in Albany. Uh, Michael Benjamin wrote a, an opinion piece for us on the uh, first read weekend. I don't know if you got a chance to read it, but if you haven't, please read it. In which he argues that, in essence, he also quotes vero, various people. Kenneth Sherrill, professor from Hunter, actually says that this has to be, you know, revamped. Uh, the, I'm, I'm, I don't have the exact column in front of me, but it, it has to be changed. Should a legislature in which two of its leaders, both in the Senate and the Assembly, are, charged, are facing charges of corruption. They had their hands in what you guys passed. Would that be what the, what you, what the Assembly and the Senate passed? Should that be re-examined because they had their hands in there? Is, 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 are you not just perpetuating the whole system? You not, Marco Crepe, yeah, no, no, being understand. a part of the I, process. Where are the reforms? I don't think so. Um, I don't think so. I've seen tremendous reforms on the institution and the way we do business. There's so many things that have been that have changed. From our perspective, we see it day in and day out. For example, younger members who have traditionally been told, you don't get many bills passed, you don't right. serve in leadership positions, you don't actually interact, if you want to be opinionated, speak your mind. We've seen that change dramatically since the leadership change happened. So there's a we've voice, had, a new voice. Oh, there's absolutely. Institutionally, we've made tremendous changes to the point that there are folks who are still trying to find their way in their, under this new system where you know everybody is relevant, everybody's voice is being heard. When we had our conferences, this year I think I've heard the most spirited conferences on every topic, every topic. Sometimes, I'll tell you what, even as a member, as much as I want to be heard and as much as I want the opportunity to make sure that my points of view end up in, in black and white in those, mm -hmm. in those bills, I got to tell you, I can imagine the difficulty institutionally. How do you deliver when everybody's opinion, everybody has a line in the sand? As an institution, at the end of the day, leadership has to be able to get people to a place where they're willing to cross their lines, find some common ground, and move forward. That's what leadership does. Unfortunately, the more you open up and you empower everyone else, Donde, donde manda, eh, eh, Capitán, capitán no manda no, marinero. No, no, no. You know, there's that saying in Spanish, right? So at some point, you need to trust leadership. And we have 
uh, new leaders who, who at our house, I know for sure, who understand that have been helpful to empower more members to be relevant, to understand, to have their opinions heard, and to be informed about everything along the way in the process. But I can imagine the person who gets hurt the most is leadership themselves because it makes it harder to just deliver on what they want. So no, I think there's been tremendous reform. I think there's been a lot of changes. And, and I would tell you, we are grateful as members that we've had so much input in every step of the way. Uh, on our exit question, and I know we're running out of time, so um, exit question, uh, the talk of the day, the serial of the day, the fool of the day, the clown on the, in the car right now uh, occupying the three ring circus is Donald Trump. Your feelings as a New Yorker seeing this figure who is an egomaniac, uh, you know, but should this guy be, uh, what should be done with Donald Trump or is it his right to be a fool and, I think Donald and embarrass Trump, all of I us? think Donald Trump has set them told for what's going to happen with Donald Trump. He was, he's a tremendous businessman, got to give him credit for what he's been able to build, what he's done. But here's a guy who exposed himself for who he really is. I think he's a joke. I think he's a comedian. I think the guy's just trying to be, you know, get attention. He loves attention. But what hurts people with money the most is when they start losing their money. And the fact that everybody started to walk away, disassociate himself from this business practice, he's not going to win this election. And on top of that, he's going to be that businessman who know, who's going to become toxic as an investor, as an investment for folks. So I'm happy he did this to himself. I don't think we have to go out of our way to hurt the guy. He did this to himself, and he's going to continue to see that pain well beyond this campaign when nobody wants to go back and revisit business. So are you buying him a bigger shovel? <laughs> he's fired. <laughs> Marco Crepo, Assembly Marco Crepo, good luck. We'll uh, have you back Thank to you. talk about SOMOS changes there at Bronx Democratic County. Anytime. Uh, for City and State TV, I'm Herson Borrero with Assemblyman Marco Crepo. Catch you on the next one.